So our next speaker is Dr. Maxine Burkett. Uh, Maxine Burkett is a professor of law at the William S. Richardson, Richardson School of Law, University of Hawaii, and a global fellow at the Woodlow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She is also co-founder and executive director of a nonprofit institute for climate and peace. Professor Burkett is an expert in the law and policy of climate change with a specific focus on climate justice, climate induced migration and climate change, peace and conflict. Her work has been cited in numerous news and policy outlets, including BBC Radio, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and Nature Climate Change. From 2009 to 2012, Professor Burkett also served as the inaugural director of the Center for Island Climate Adaptation and Policy. Professor Burkett received her Bachelor's of Arts degree from Williams College and Exeter College, Oxford University, and she received her Juris Doctor from the University of California at Berkeley. The title of her talk today is First Do No Harm, Climate Reparations and Guarantees of Non-Repetition. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Professor Maxine Burkett. On this conference um, and uh, some were a little too early for me to, to see, but um, but but I've worked with Rasna and, and Kyle and, and Vicky, of course, who I work with very closely here and have a had the pleasure to work with over the last few years with the RISA uh, and specifically in Marshall Islands migration. So this is sort of a nice tie in to um, some of the work that uh, some of the sort of the larger themes that I will be talking about now. And of course, um, that we've sort of worst researched in, in the same sort of Pacific RISA family together. So again, thank you uh, so much. Um, I'm now going to start this. I, I just want to sort of so, uh, start the talk. I, I, lately, I have been starting all, all of my talks, almost all of my talks, with this image of, of, a, of an octopus in the parking garage. And there are a few reasons of this. I, I have My research is looking at climate justice generally, and I've certainly been looking specifically at climate migration and also at the, um, the disproportionate impacts of, of climate change on certain communities. And climate migration and displacement is one of those impacts. Um, and when I uh, when I first saw this image, it's, it really struck me as sort of a, one of the ways in which we are um, not necessarily taking into account the uh, sort of no analog events that are that are ahead of us. And this image is from um, November 2016. It's a it's a king tide that happened in Miami Beach, Florida, and it carried an octopus into a parking garage in Miami Beach. And uh, that that day, the the news article simply said that these sort of workers put it back in the ocean. But this was not from an extreme weather event per se. Obviously, Florida is used to uh, major storms, but this is a, a high high tide day, and this is what high high tides do. They they carry oct octopodes into uh, parking garages. And at the time, my colleagues in the environmental law world, professors uh, Rob Virchik and Dan Farber, they wrote an op-ed and 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 described this as sort of the fitting alternative. To the typical elephant in the room, sort of the big, odd, undeniably present entity that no one is willing to discuss. Uh, here in Hawaii, we, uh, in the Mapuna Puna area, it's the baby hammerhead shark in the intersection. Uh, I've given this presentation in Florida, and they've described other circumstances that are um, that are quite unique, um, uh, like the sea urchin in the storm drain. So these are these are events that are without historical analogs, and the no analog future, I would argue, has seismic implications for the law, which is what I think a lot about, and its intersection with climate change. And phenomena like uh, climate-induced migration specifically demonstrate that well, right? The fact that we are at an era in which um, no analog events will become more of the norm, and our legal system is used to a bit more of a stationary climate and a lot more predictability in the natural environment. But we are entering into a different phase. And uh, Professor Glenn Albrecht has written a, a lot about the interesting ways that we can be thinking about this, this um, you know, long future. And he said specifically in the Anthropocene, the so-called new normal, or what I prefer to conceptualize as the new abnormal, life will be characterized by uncertainty, unpredictability, genuine chaos, and relentless change. 
um, I think he's right, unfortunately. And the law struggles with advancing coherent and comprehensive approaches that will help us navigate this unprecedented future and do so in a spirit of sustained partnership, trust, and a sense of shared purpose, which I think is critically important, and attempts to build that body of law and the principles of compassion and equity that will undergird it, I think, are exceptionally important at this time. And that's what I'm arguing um, in a couple of the more recent writings that I've done, but specifically in this uh, Behind the Veil article, which is really looking for um, an opportunity for us to initiate a process to help identify what we need from our jurisprudence or legal system at this time, given the climate forecast as we understand it. And on the assumption that the most vulnerable amongst us matter, um, the upcoming uh, project that I'm working on now and with this, this piece is really going to sort of think about towards the end of this presentation is how do we repair? Uh, what does reparation look like in, uh, for, the, for the most vulnerable? Um, and and as importantly, what does it look like if we are to guarantee non-repetition? So in other words, um, there has been, a, I think, a, a more vocal press for, for climate reparations. I can say a little bit more about what that means and what it looks like, what the proposals are looking like, um, at least in, in sort of popular discussion. But um, uh, what I've, I've always sort of uh, tried to convey is that reparations and repair are so critically important, not only because an apology is important and uh, being able to make someone whole again is important, but so is the opportunity to sort of create circumstances for a more just outcome. Um, and so I'll say a, a bit about that later on, but that's the important piece of this, which is that guarantee of non-repetition. I have two young children um, who might actually at some point scamper on to the screen. Let's uh, let's hope not, but if they were to, um, some of the messages that I share with them is that if they've done something um, wrong, even if they didn't intend to do it, a sorry is great and it's helpful and hopefully it's an opportunity to reflect, but what are the systems and processes in our household that would allow for us not to have that? that um, sort of that wrong repeated. And that's what we're looking at in this context. But for climate change, different scale, uh, different scope, it's an extraordinary question and quite literally extraordinary um, because more than compensation is what it's asking for. It's really understanding the foundational issues with contemporary life that have sort of produced the circumstances that we see now. And again, I think the context of climate migration uh, and the circumstances of climate migration really encapsulate that well. So here's how I'll walk through um, the sort of our conversation um, this for the next uh, you know 30 or so minutes. Um, first, I'm going to discuss what uh, is meant by climate justice, and that's be beyond simply the sort of the law and policy of climate change. I'll, and I'll sort of largely illustrate what I mean by climate justice and some of the injustices that we're seeing um, uh, through maps, images, and graphics that tell sort of the vivid story of some of the root issues. I'll then briefly introduce the complex. Uh, field of, of climate induced migration, or what we understood in a, again, a popular way as a more popular discourse as climate refugees, the climate displacement migration relation, uh, relocation concerns that communities across the globe are experiencing right at this moment. Um, I'll then consider if our systems, legal and otherwise, are capable of responding adequately, especially when they might be uh, uh, part of the, the problem. <laughs> and then I'll sort of close with some thinking on what emerging theories of justice would look like and how they relate to this key element of reparations, um, th that guarantee of non-repetition. So um, mapping climate change and climate justice. Um, climate change is a shared global crisis that certain countries have been the disproportionate sources of. And we've known about this, is certainly in the United States, uh, for quite some time. And um, uh, I don't know if, who out there may know this, but um, the first president to be formally briefed about climate change was uh, President Lyndon Johnson. I, usually when I share this with my students, they're really surprised uh, to know that this is sort of 55 years of, of, of uh, knowledge at the highest levels. Um, Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965, November of 1965, received a document called Restoring the Quality of Our Environment. And if you look at the table of contents of that document, it looks a lot like one of the uh, regional climate reports, the National Climate Assessment you see today, uh, discussion of melting ice caps, um, rising sea levels, warmer oceans, even the issues around ocean acidification. The language is um, eerily accurate. Uh, and describes the um, the sort of delicate the delicate nature of the systems that we're tinkering with, right? These uh, these are small fractions that are of vital importance in terms of emissions. Within a few centuries, uh, the, our processes have uh, have extracted carbon 
um, that has been sequestered for half a billion years. Um, the language about the worldwide industrial civilization, we are con unwittingly conducting a vast geophysical experiment deleterious from the point of view of human beings, and I would uh, offer uh, non-human beings as well. And uh, even the suggestion of, uh, or hinting towards uh, engineering of some sort, the possibilities of deliberately bringing about countervailing climatic changes therefore need to be thoroughly explored. I think it's really important too that we recognize that the um, not only were the was the White House uh, aware of what was happening and every subsequent president, uh, but so too were the fossil fuel industries. This is a document from 1977, an internal memo that demonstrated that the understanding of the fossil fuel companies was quite um, significant with respect to the relationship of our carbon dioxide emissions and the impacts on our uh, global environment. Um, and there was a level of accuracy that's really quite amazing in terms of the ability to predict where we would be uh, by when and some of the impacts of them. And, and some of those impacts included the, the migration of people <laughs> um, and, uh, and uh, other attending concerns. There, there are two physical scientists that I like to cite and in, in, in these presentations because I think that they're, the way that they've described the problem also really is relevant to um, the policy, law, and, and social science world. So David King was the UK science, uh, climate science advisor he was describing the melting of the, um, uh, of the glaciers in Greenland, and he said the maps of the world will have to be redrawn. Uh, so again, although in reference to glacier melt, uh, this is so relevant to the ways in which we've organized ourselves in the geopolitical landscape. Um, and because of changes to this landscape, many more people uh, are, that we're seeing moving right now as a result of climate change, many more will have to, to move uh, on top of that. So if we understand the climate acting on the physical map here, um, this is the map that we've created. And this is, this is almost as important, I would argue, as the geophysical experiment that we, are, uh, that we are conducting right now. Borders and jurisdictions make movement more difficult within countries. It can internally, depending on internal um, policies, domestic policies, and of course, across borders, which we've seen in such stark relief recently with some of the uh, the border concerns that have um, that have really dogged our political system and many others in uh, in Europe as well. The, pro the 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 each line that you see drawn, each color that you see set off, does not map onto obviously to the physical map as as um, uh, as as in an effective way. Uh, it reinforces and and reinforces a notion that borders meaningfully define or delimit what we would call national interests. Uh, but it, particularly as it relates to a change in climate, we may need to think again about the level of, um, of indifference climate change has to the physical map and what that means for the political map as well. And of course, there are equity considerations, because what we see here in terms of de demarcations of nations is also reflected in our relationship to the global environment. This next global map is a bit different, right? Each country here, what you're looking at is each country's um, uh, Emissions of carbon dioxide in a single year. This was 2007. This is a 2009 publication of this map. And the map is distorting each country based on its carbon emissions. And what you're seeing is um, clear differences again in terms of what the physical map looks like and the actual um, map of our uh, impact on the atmospheric chemistry over time. Um, certain qu countries dwarf entire continents. This is a significant year also because this is the uh, around this, the time where China. Uh, exceeded the United States in terms of annual emissions. Uh, but again, if you can imagine that uh, continents like South America and uh, Africa uh, could fit very comfortably inside either of these countries, we can see the differences in the uh, actual uh, uh, footprint, if you will, the carbon footprint of, of, of both the consumption and the uh, burning of, of emissions, consumption of, of um, goods and the emissions that need to be uh, conducted for those creation of those goods. So if we look at that as a snapshot, we understand the, the differences um, in different countries' use of the global atmosphere, right, um, and the atmospheric commons. And we can also understand, for example, that countries like uh, small islands in the Caribbean and the Pacific, which barely register on this map, uh, have significant concerns about the impacts that they're experiencing almost entirely at a disproportionate level. Um, another way to look at the inequities is this emissions uh, uh, chart 
that it is, is just demonstrating historical emissions, uh, cumulative CO2 emissions since 1850 um, to 2011. You can see here, again, the United States is really uh, sort of edging forward in terms of its impact uh, over, over time. And historical contribution also becomes very significant, um, certainly in terms of our use of the global commons and the perspective of those who are sitting of most of the world in that 17% in the, in the upper uh, left quadrant. Uh, of that percentage, uh, the small island states uh, altogether barely register under 1% um, of that uh, high. Another uh, way to look at it, and the final way I'll show you in terms of graphs, is this per capita emissions for top 10 emitters. This is uh, 2011. It's important to recognize that um, there are different ways of understanding our use of the global um, uh, uh, atmosphere, climate climate in the atmosphere. Um, in fact, when we think about uh, the, the China and the United States having this sort of um, longstanding geopolitical tension around emissions, if we look at the per capita emissions, the story becomes quite different, which is to say that we're still sort of, at, as the U.S. at least, um, uh, well ahead of, of the average and even other large countries and their emissions. And if you can imagine this bar graph being extended um, uh, to your right, uh, a good distance um, wrapping around probably the back wall of your of the room that you're sitting in, you will uh, find this the small bar that represents countries like the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Right. This is um, important to consider when discussing responses to major disruptive forces like climate induced migration. So, what you see here is a map of um, the the Pacific, and I want to just first say that we know that there are other non climate change related dynamics that uh, that can help us understand the early sea level impacts that, uh, con that countries in the Western Pacific are experiencing. Um, that's where you see the sort of red blush color um, in the Western Pacific. We're also learning through, uh, again, research done um, in partnership with, with Theresa, that the drowning islands narrative may be the least accurate in the near term, although it's obviously, it's obviously relevant in terms of the next generation or two in viabilities, viability in these islands. But today we're seeing um, that the narrative of, of thirsty or extremely hot islands are perhaps more in point for now and, and in terms of affecting um, habitability. And those impacts were, will um, obviously become more severe as time passes. This may be a preview of things to come and it's made unambiguous, certainly in the context of sea level rise by media reports like this one. You're making this island disappear. Uh, these are concerns of the, the small island states, uh, countries like Kiribati, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands, uh, the Maldives. Um, what you're seeing here is an image of Malay. It's the financial and political heart of the country. No more than three meters at its highest point, already significantly hard armored around the entirety of the uh, main island and is still experiencing significant breaches of the infrastructure they've put up. So while climate Forecasters deem small islanders as among the most vulnerable to climate change impacts. A subset of small islanders, as I've mentioned, um, also face the specter of permanent loss of territory, rendering them migrants without a home or country. And in that regard, um, the, uh, another quotation from a physical scientist is relevant to the legal and political future of some nation states. And in particular, uh, we've effectively entered a no analog state, right? Professor Zibi was describing the rate of carbon release um, that we're experiencing now, which is much uh, greater than it was um, at its other highest point, 55.5 uh, million years ago. Uh, that, of course, is a time when we did not have a sort of dog in the fight. Uh, we are entering a state in which statelessness itself is taking on a very new um, uh, characteristic and one that the law, again, has not fully fleshed out the implications of. So I'd like to say a little bit more about this displacement migration relocation piece, which is um, important to understand because um, the terms are often used if they are um, interchangeably or they're used um, or terms like climate refugees will be used. And, and I'll say in a second why that's not quite accurate. But first, what we're talking about are, are different kinds of mobility, human mobility. Um, and displacement, migration, and planned relocation generally describe different phenomenon. Um, oftentimes, interchangeably, displacement and migration are used. Climate displaced persons is often used to describe those who we might say are climate refugees. That's an emerging term to describe those on the move. 
But displacement is more specifically describing circumstances in which people are forced to leave their homes. It's usually associated with sudden shocks or sudden disasters. Um, migration is usually deemed to be more voluntary. Although, of course, the line between voluntary and forced is a bit, uh, it's a spectrum. Um, and it's hard to describe that uh, oftentimes to categorize one or the, a type of movement as one or the other. Um, but it's usually associated with risks that take place over time and perhaps over borders. Uh, and planned relocation is an organized decision to relocate communities, usually carried out by the state um, in order to reduce the community's risk to external impacts. And there, I, I should say, there's certain things that we know about the kinds of climate migration that's happening at present. We know that it's already happening within countries from countries like ours, very, very wealthy countries like the United States, to countries like the Solomon Islands and the Pacific. We also know that the poorest of the poor, the most severely um, affected, the most vulnerable, and usually can't leave. In fact, um, another way we can understand this is that there are those who can move that can have the luxury of human mobility, and then there are trapped populations. Um, those who don't have the financial resources or the community networks and destination locations uh, to make that, uh, to make a move. We also know that indigenous peoples are severely affected uh, as migration also introduces this disruption uh, to systems of traditional knowledge and is a significant heritage and cultural loss um, if asked to move from specific lands. Um, there are many core issues to this phenomenon that are less clear, such as how to legally define those displaced, migrating, or relocated. Um, we have a very clear definition of what a refugee is based on the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees, a definition that was really reflecting um, the political exigencies of that time, some 70 years ago, post-World War II. And a refugee can be understood in, in a, at least three different ways, what legally is stipulated in national or international law, politically um, as interpreted to meet sort of the political exigencies of the time, and sociologically, so reflecting an empirical reality. But under the existing refugee convention, the legal stipulations fail with respect to climate for the most part. Um, and that means that uh, there are limited avenues, if any, in the existing law around um, refugee law that would relate to the circumstances of climate change, um, and namely absence of and membership of a particular class, uh, lack of urgency in some types of climate-induced migration uh, is an issue, and oftentimes a lack of um, uh, circumstances that one would consider uh, being based on the fear of persecution. So those absences mean that something like uh, uh, the Refugee Convention is not necessarily triggered, again, by the circumstances that many people will move with respect to climate change. We also have um, some clear issues with understanding exactly how many people will be moving. This is purportedly um, how many millions would be displaced by sea level alone um, based on the number of meters uh, in, of sea level rise. And I use this graph just to sort of suggest that, the, demonstrate the upward trend, to suggest that there's some really important social science that's going on to better understand what's happening and what the numbers might look like. But this prediction is probably um, wrong, right? Um, it's really, there are a number of factors, I can say a lot more about why, but there are a number of factors that, uh, that make it difficult to get an exact number of how people move, not the least of which is that people make decisions that aren't necessarily um, easily predictable. But we do know that there have been attempts, many attempts to get an understanding of the number of people who will move. Uh, I've seen numbers as low as 25 million um, and as high as 1 billion and even a, 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 a one research uh, project that, that estimated 2 billion um, based on different trajectories of greenhouse gas emissions. But if you just take the 25 million to 1 billion, which is most often identified as a range, it's a difference with a factor of 40. And I like to express to my students how difficult it is to plan for something like that. If, I, if the, for the Easter holiday, for Passover, uh, I, we were having a dinner party and I said to my husband, we could be, uh, we're, we're hosting and we could have as many as 25 or a thousand people uh, coming, let's let's cook, let's plan. It would be really difficult to plan for that number, yet we need to plan so that we understand how many people we need to comfortably accommodate. Uh, other numbers that are mo most commonly cited are in the 200 and 250 million by 2050. Again, there's a lot of difficulty in understanding the um, whether or not that's accurate. Uh, and the, uh, the researcher that's most cited said he came up that, with that number using heroic extrapolations, right? Sort of conceding that there's a lot of uh, assumptions that uh, have to be made in order to come up with a number, but we understand that a number is necessary not only to express the scope of the problem, but also, again, to have any hope at uh, planning appropriately for 
the kinds of dislocations that we might see. Uh, this is a conceptual challenge that has uh, dogged a lot of the research that can happen on uh, sort of proactively working on issues related to climate induced migration. But we also know that certain communities are impacted um, pretty definitively today. Uh, many in the Delta regions across the world, certainly small atoll nations. Um, and again, it could be sea level rise, it could be other uh, climate change impacts. The Arctic indigenous communities are absolutely at the front lines um, uh, today in our country, as well as the indigenous Delta communities um, as well. So one way I'd like to describe this is that um, when we think about the difficulty of understanding the relationship of climate change, it's because migration is multi-causal with multiple drivers. And I can attest to this process. Um, I'm from Jamaica originally, and I was certainly too young to sort of weigh in at the time. But my, my parents' migration decision making looked something like this um, uh, in terms of the factors. Environmental drivers are, is a big one that you see there, but so are social drivers, political and demographic and economic. Um, uh, for my dad, it was uh, political and economic at the time. For my mother, it was social, namely her, her husband was planning to move to the States. But based on what we understand about climate change and climate forecasts in the future, this is still a relevant understanding that that dark arrow that says the influence of environmental change on those drivers will become even more relevant and, uh, as time passes. Um, and climate change and its steep trajectory is uh, going to be a big part of people having to get to that decision point of whether or not to migrate or stay. And again, understanding that that decision making itself is a bit of a, a luxury. So, um, but we're seeing it and we're seeing the, the beginnings of that, um, that need to come to that decision point. Uh, we're also, again, needing to see the legal and popular discourse reflect the changes that uh, we're, we're um, observing. This is a, just a, I want to share a, a, a quick graph that's demonstrating the relationship between migration and temperature. These are correlations, this is the causal linkages need more um, research um, and also will be confounded by the number of different drivers. But we're seeing a trend here, which is to say um, that as average temperatures have increased, the changes in migration at that top right um, quadrant uh, are also being um, uh, documented. Um, and uh, the graph is, is showing that relationship between increasing temperatures and increased migration. And especially for, um, for the United States, I want to sort of identify some of those notable outliers like El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala because they become relevant when we think about the nature of our discussion today about immigration and the tenor of that discussion when we think about long-term planning. So um, very quickly, the five, five, there are five scenarios that will um, determine um, that are sort of identified as ways as triggers for migration, sudden onset disasters, uh, slow onset environmental degradation, destruction of small island states, uh, relocation or designated prohibited areas for human habitation, unrest, violence, and conflict over resources. For purposes of time, I'm just going to very quickly describe um, each of them by showing you just sort of quick images of what we're describing um, when we talk about climate um, induced migration under these scenarios. Uh, Hurricane Maria is a perfect example of this. Uh, the, the Puerto Rico was reeling after Irma just a couple of weeks earlier in 2017. Uh, almost 200,000 people were displaced to the to the continental U.S. during the storm. This is a, also uh, a significant. Uh, the 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 severity of the storms is significant even in countries that have sort of world class um, disaster risk reduction measures in place. Typhoon Hagibis was a significant disruptive uh, force in last year in Japan. Uh, in terms of slow onset events, the relationship between food security and migration becomes important. This is one of maybe the less known uh, triggers of migration. But we even have, um, as old as uh, 10 years now, uh, research that's identifying the relationship between, say, crop yields and migration and identifying it at some of the most contentious border spaces. At, at this point, um, uh, again, 10 years ago, researchers had found a significant effect of climate-driven changes in crop yields and the rate of emigration to the United States. A 10% reduction in crop yields would lead to an additional 2% of the population emigrating and extrapolating, extrapolating out to the future. Uh, there was a estimated 1.4 to 6.7 million more adults emigrating because of the decline in, uh, in agricultural productivity by 2080, depending on warming scenarios. If we mitigate, if we adapt, of course, that will make a difference. And throughout the globe, decision makers um, are conducting these high stakes debates on border control 
many, many with explicit xenophobic uh, uh, undercurrents without understanding a key variable um, to people's um, need to move. And so the question becomes, again, for the law, is this predominantly an immigration issue, an environmental issue, a national security concern, or one of equity and justice? And I think when we uh, look, think back to the migrant caravan um, uh, language and the uh, vilification of migrants, the understanding of the relationship between climate and uh, and their need to migrate was becoming a bit better uh, uh, discussed, at least, or identified. And uh, there even was an above the fold last April, uh, almost exactly a year ago, that was describing Central American farmers heading to the U.S. and fleeing climate change. Um, and at the time, the article was describing that, that increased number of migrants that uh, are having to move because they're, they're in just their their farms and, and the industry generally is collapsing due to drought. And what's interesting, and I offer a specific example of un, uh, unpredicted uh, un analog circumstances, perhaps, we're seeing a number of Honduran migrants arriving in Hawaii uh, as part of uh, the Hawaii coffee producing um, um, industry, um, ostensibly drawn by, by the opportunity to work in a familiar industry and in sort of chain um, migration modality, so you follow your family or other acquaintances. We have now um, a, a vibrant, um, a growing Honduran community uh, in places in Hawaii, where is, which is the only place you can grow coffee in the US um, that uh, has a, a, a Honduran migrants. And we're getting, uh, we seem to be, uh, we'll likely see more. And how can we um, be a space that uh, embraces that migration with a spirit of, of welcome? Uh, that's an important question. So in this article, the farmers were asking, we're, we're stating the weather is crazy, everything is out of control. So this is a different kind of driver. Um, and climate change is, is presented as a tipping point in this article um, and violence, poverty are prime drivers. And that's that's very true and is certainly a big part of a lot of the other kinds of movement that we're seeing. But climate change can be an, a tipping point and it's already today's tip that can have profound inc consequences if you consider the relevant uh, relative numbers against the backdrop of our existing legal arrangements. It's important to note, for example, that uh, of the in the highest tension points in terms of uh, migration in the EU, the numbers of migrants uh, constituted 0.2 percent, 0.2 percent of each of the populations of the EU and Australia, and in the height of our concerns, only 0.02 percent of the population of the U.S. So the last. Uh, Climate migration scenario that I, I mentioned was with respect to conflict over resources, and I, I don't have the time to sort of delve into this, so I'm happy to, to answer any questions that may come up in the Q&A, but the, the long and the short of it is that uh, we saw alongside um, uh, poor leadership and, and unrest in the region, the uh, Syrian uh, refugee crisis, which uh, some have argued has, was kicked off with the, uh, or tipped at the very least, with the multiple droughts experienced in the region. So if we think about what we do in response um, and how much we are um, obviously seeing a peak, getting a peak into the new abnormal, the question becomes how we can respond um, appropriately and in a way that um, ensures justice. And uh, I like to offer um, Jane McAdams important words here, which is to say legal, legal definitions bind states in ways that descriptive labels cannot. This is important to consider because if you're thinking about what you'd like to have happen um, and what will happen um, and in terms of protection based on the law, there's a big gulf there, I, I would argue still. So for example, while refugee may have political and sociological relevance, the absence of the sort of legal definition means that those people who are moving have no rights that they can actually appeal to. And without those rights, we have uh, no obligations under the law to, to assist in appropriate ways. That's further complicated by the fact that displacement happens in different ways over different um, localities, um, uh, in different time scales, and also engages different areas of the law. We have in our system of law uh, a very uh, compartmentalized and fragmented approaches to some major themes that, again, climate migration as a perfect example uh, of the number of, of, of thematic areas in the law uh, and legal systems that don't interact enough, um, if at all, to address an issue that absolutely cross cuts international laws, uh, legal systems, domestic, and then of course those that cross borders. This is difficult for the legal system.
and really t test the ability for it to remain vibrant and resilient. I was talking to a friend who's a systems um, uh, expert. She does a lot of systems theory, and, and one of the questions is, she asked is, what capabilities does a system need to respond to challenges with vibrancy and resiliency? And um, these questions, uh, I think, are important for all systems to uh, ask it themselves uh, and recognizing if that you are a part of one. And certainly the legal system has a similar set of questions to ask. And so I would I have asked um, and um, and a number of excellent researchers are thinking deeply about what it means to be vibrant and resilient in this context. What capabilities do we have in the legal system? If we understand that it's plausible, probable maybe, uh, that the global experience of more than three degrees Celsius temperature increase and possibly five degrees by 2080, the global temperature increase would quite literally produce a whole new world. Uh, few appreciate, I think, in, in my field, the enormity of the task to respond to no analog events like large scale climate induced migration and worse, uh, we expect environmental law and an international environmental law alone to do all of the work. And I've asked why and how can it? There is increasing change um, as well as an increase in the rate of change. Uh, and I think a similar and uh, a similar kind of change um, and an increase in the rate of change is needed for the law, um, if only to keep pace with what we understand to be coming at us. Uh, and certainly to have a fighting chance at just outcomes. And this shift, I would argue, doesn't necessarily need better environmental law. It requires a whole new thinking about our socio-legal systems. And that's perhaps the most slippery and unwieldy octopus in the parking garage. And so when we think about um, what, what we need to, um, to solve this problem, this is a favorite of mine, this New Yorker cartoon, right? A complex input, a uh, complex output, there's a miracle that, that's needed. We need to be more explicit about that, what, that, what we mean by that. And this is where we seem to be when contemplating systemic transformations, intentional or climate induced. We are essentially relying on a miracle, but I hope we've um, sort of better understood that the climate phenomenon is a geopolitical one as well. And it really does implicate our worldviews and our current legal and political systems. And a uh, few effects of climate straight change demonstrate that more than the disarray resulting from climate-induced displacement, migration, and relocation. And that migration presents novel legal issues, right? Such as the unique kind of 21st century statelessness uh, that the Marshallese and Maldivians must contemplate. It also provokes all of the unfinished work of our current legal regimes, namely power, uh, whether they're fossil fuel derived or whether they are describing the differential heft at the negotiating table at the Framework Convention on Climate Change. It also implicates issues of historical contributions, not just to the global uh, uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, but to other countries and communities' vulnerability to the impacts of climate change. The major, major components of our legal infrastructure have gotten us here and have supported the continued paralysis. And there's, there are a number of climate justice scholars that I have to sort of, uh, that I, I can't identify each, but there are a number of that have inspired me, certainly in thinking about this. Professor Anna Greer, analyzes law structural complicity in the uneven outcomes and forecasts for the poor and of color globally. She notes that the very design of law, particularly corporate law and international trade law, is fundamentally predisposed to environmental degradation and less concerned about the, the social implications of their, that impact. Uh, Marcus Hedall uh, um, argues, among other things, that the inability to clearly articulate our duties or obligations to the most vulnerable um, in, in response to identifiable, at least human rights, is a wrong in and of itself. Right? What we have, we have to identify what it is that we we owe, owe to others. Um, climate justice can also leverage important critiques like that of Jaya Ramjino Gallus, who's critiquing international migration law and what she argues is an active creation of refugee crises by the law's own parameters. And it does this in a number of ways. But one uh, obvious example is that it requires migrants to access the state's territory to appeal for refugee status and doing so means embarking on more than likely a, a risky and perhaps extra legal journey. Um, and she also demonstrated the crisis is created by the, the legal system in a way that it doesn't have to be. It's not about absolute capacity as mentioned in terms of numbers, but about um, the uh, ability to manage it and the capability to be vibrant and resilient in the face of these movements. And so um, in trying to be more explicit, uh, thinking about how, what kinds of uh, systems of, of justice we'd like to introduce becomes incredibly important. 
I um, want to be mindful of the time right now, and um, and I want to uh, just say that uh, you know if there's time, I can say more about this in the in the Q and A. But a lot of the work that I, I'm doing now is trying to think about how we can be more explicit um, in in step two. And I, I do have, want to explicitly thank Kyle White for his help in um, in helping me sort of think through some of what the um, political philosophy would suggest when we answer the question of what does it look like um, to create a system in which uh, we think that the outcomes are, are just even for the most vulnerable. Uh, so that if, um, and we were to reincarnate years from now, if we were Marshallese or the CEO of a multinational oil and gas company or a coffee farmer in Honduras making uh, his or her way to Honolulu that we have created circumstances that would still be considered just, what does that look like? And how might we all engage in that conversation to effectively ensure that it happens at all scales uh, over time? So I'll stop there and uh, thank you so much for, again, the opportunity to present on this. Professor Burkett, thank you so much for such a wonderful, wonderful talk, very powerful, especially in relation to, to the justice, philosophical component of justice and the moral framework, uh, and in relation to the, the most vulnerable and how, what is the rest of the world's responsibilities to them. Um, I would like to now turn the time over to Kate Seaman, who will take us through the questions and answer period. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so again, we have the question and answer box on the right hand side. So if the audience have any questions, you can pop those um, in the box right there, and then I will will read them out, Professor Burkett. Um, I'm going to start off with one question for you to kind of hopefully prompt some more more questions. And uh, my question is, how do we ensure that the focus is on the most vulnerable, especially if we are going to be rethinking socio legal systems? How do we ensure that, that the focus remains on those who are most vulnerable? Yeah, I'm, um, that's thank you. That's a really um, important question. And I. Uh, um, I think a lot of the, the the climate justice advocates out there are doing that's the work that they're doing right is trying to tell the full story of how um, people today are experiencing the impacts of climate change and how much worse it'll be over time. But of course, they are also um, telling the story of how we got here, right? How we got to this point of increased vulnerability. And so um, I think that the the question, um, the answer to the question of how we ensure that the most vulnerable remain. In um, in our thinking in terms of justice is, um, is by talking about it, right? Is by having opportunities for us to to always describe this, the difference differences in impact. I'll also say there's been a sort of uh, a progression of, of of discussion around what climate change really means. Um, and again, a lot of this was about the geophysics of climate for so long, right? Is the science true? Is it happening? And then became, then it became about the sort of politics and economics of responding to it. So much so that we even asked the question about whether or not to respond to it, which is essentially a question about the ethics and justice of it with cost benefit analyses. Well, how much is it going to cost us? What does it mean relative to the other economies? And now I think we're coming to a point where it's undeniable the impacts and uh, and certainly it's undeniable that the impacts are disproportionately um, um, burdening communities of color, indigenous communities, uh, the global and, and, and vulnerable communities in the global south that we need to be thinking um, differently about how we structure our conversations on next steps. Great, thank you. Um, so again, the, the chat box is open if anybody has questions. I don't wanna fill up the time with all my questions, I have lots. <laughs> Hoda? Hey, go ahead, go ahead, I'll wait. Oh, no, you go ahead, mine can wait. So I was given, you know, you just mentioned that at first it was the science that, you know, people were disputing over. And then now it's more the polit political realm and economics. And I, I wanted to, I'm asking you to uh, project into the future a little, but in your opinion, um, how dire things have to get mm. before the politics and the economics of this kick into gear? Yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> I think you're getting at a really important point, which is uh, underlying point, right? Which is that um, people, the, it, 
you know, being at the front lines, uh, when, once the front comes to you, <laughs> you know, and if it comes undeniable, you are going to act. Um, and we're seeing that that's true, uh, certainly over the last few years, we're even seeing in terms of the sort of political polling and speaking specifically about the US, that um, the um, understanding that the acceptance of this, the climate science is increasing, the, uh, the importance of it being uh, amongst the sort of top policy platforms, at least for one of uh, one political party for the, for the Democratic Party is significantly um, uh, increased and is in, is it critically important in terms of, of the policy platform. So I think we've already gotten we've already see that it has to get pretty bad <laughs> in order for people to um, to have had moved it up the um, in terms of the policy platform. And of course, you know, we're at about 1.1 about uh, degrees above the um, average and uh, of what we're used to. We're in completely uncharted territory. And it's um, it's and it's getting even later. And so we one would hope that before it gets much worse, that we will do all of the very important work that we need to do to mitigate and appropriately adapt um, uh, to that. So I I don't know how long it'll take, but I know that the difference the the proximity that one has to the impacts of climate change has been significant, uh, and the reframing of it in terms of understanding its disproportionate impact has been, I think, a powerful uh, and important shift. Can I follow up on that, Kate? So given what you just described uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's gotten pretty bad, but, uh, you know, it, nothing is really happening. I, I'm, I'm wondering, meaning not enough is happening. Um, I'm wondering if when things get pretty bad, uh, do you envision, I mean, simp simply said, the military, as you indicated, has known about this, at least in the U.S., you said, since the, admin the Johnson, the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. And so, in what well, I guess my question is this, the military is aware of what's happening. Uh, obviously, politicians are informed about this, but um, do you feel that at some point the military, if things get so bad that we will have to have a shift in how to convince the politicians to do more uh, because the military sees the absol absolute dangers of the security of the nations and this and that? You know, I, I just wondered what you think about possible scenarios. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, what I will say is that the um the military uh, and and from sort of a current serving to and certainly retired um, higher ups have all been identifying this as a significant th the threat multiplier is oftentimes the term that's used and a significant threat to national security, significant threat to assets um, across across the globe. Uh, understand that and the impacts on um, and sort of hot spots throughout the world and what that means for the military installation specifically. It has been um, also active in, um, uh, in, in decarbonizing uh, some of its, some of its, uh, its own infrastructure. Um, I, I think the military has been actually of all of the <laughs> branches of, of the executive at least have been pretty significant um, voices in understanding the, the, the threats of climate change. Now, again, it's we were not seeing commensurate responses, and I also think that we have the concern of when you frame a problem as a security issue, um, then you the you know if if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you uh, if you think about this as a security issue, a national security issue versus one of equity, justice, uh, um, uh, more sort of human rights concerns, the differences and responses will be evident. And that's not to say we don't need a little bit of, uh, of both, uh, but at the same time, what we find certainly in the context of migration and cross-border movement, the way you frame that kind of phenomenon um, will determine how you respond to it. You could easily acknowledge, and this is one of the concerns that I have when talking about climate-induced migration, because oftentimes that's used to further fuel xenophobic concerns about people moving into communities that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that other you know, migrants in a, in a way that's not um, acknowledging or confirming or affirming those civil and, and political rights. So, in other words, um, if we were to 
understand this as one of justice and equity and of human rights, you're going to have a different set of responses likely than those that might happen if, you, if you're looking at your borders as spaces to hold a line in a, secured, in a sort of national security framing. Does, I hope, does that make sense? Um, um, I, I essentially is describing this as one where uh, it matters that we have a, a healthy, uh, vibrant discourse uh, in, the, in the human rights context as well. That absolutely makes sense. Thank you so much for your response. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of questions from um, the audience too. So the first is, what are your thoughts about which policies might be more within reach in the US considering the current political gridlock? Yeah, I know. I mean, the current political gridlock is really quite remarkable. Here's what I will say. I do think, um, I think that, um, the, if if given the uh, opportunity to develop as a policy that the Green New Deal will not only seem um, uh, completely palatable, <laughs> but absolutely necessary. Um, what we're seeing is if you if you read the the resolution um, and the the sketching of the proposal, it is identifying the uh, the need to dramatically reduce our emissions and acknowledging that in any transition. There are going to be some that are disproportionately impacted that by that in negative ways, and so the Green New Deal then it sort of says we're going to do this rapid um, ratchet down of emissions, and then you know look at part two. We're going to make sure that everyone is a part of a just transition, uh, healthcare, uh, job security, um, engagement with labor and environment in ways that are really critically important. This is not particularly controversial, I think, in normal circumstances, right? You actually would want to know that your policy is taking into account those who are not going to benefit, um, at least in the very, very short term, and look for uh, ways to ease that transition for everyone. And also, I think fundamentally that policy acknowledges that there is a transition coming, uh, it's happening, um, and it's uh, the climate is changing, and it's having devastating impacts. Um, and so the, how do we want to weather that? Do we want to have agency and make sure everyone comes along, or do we want to do this in a way that's uh, uncoordinated and, uh, and in many cases unjust? And it's uh, its actual experience. Thank you. So the next one is, what do you think of the relevance of more ancient philosophical approaches to law that include the concept of ataraxia and regard for natural human response to primordial empirical data and the phenomenology of deprivation? Okay, so um, that's, uh, I, I would say, sort of at the outer edges of my um, experience and, and what I'm looking at at this, mo at this point. But I will say this, I do think, and if I, if you, if you, I know my slides are still up and if you can just bear with me, I'd like to just go ahead a little bit um, to some of the things I wasn't able to quite address. But I do wanna say um, that, you know, oftentimes when we think about these thorny problems, we have a, a sense that this is sort of too big to, um, too big to resolve in any meaningful way. And I just would suggest obviously that climate change itself is much worse, it's much bigger and much worse than actually contemplating these kinds of systemic changes. And I do think that the looking back um, at some of the, um, the, the sort of uh, ancestral understandings of, of how we resolve, uh, how we deal with complexity, how we uh, integrate resilience into our planning, how we understand relationships between the human and non-human world in a way that is, um, that's beneficial for everyone. We have intellectual technology um, there. Uh, and um, I oftentimes use this as sort of a closing thought because uh, we oftentimes at the ends of climate presentations, we see solar arrays and windmills and we're looking at renewable technology and there's intellectual technology that's there that's already exists, that's already providing alternative paradigms and um, numerous rights discourses and critical legal theories are part of that. And uh, I think that um, I've certainly, I'd be curious to know more about what the questioner is um, uh, specifically referencing, but I certainly have been excited by the work in indigenous legal orders, earth jurisprudence, uh, ecological bottom lines, uh, theories of living from the yield, and of course, environmental justice um, uh, understandings for, for that earth jurisprudence sort of movement and think that those are, are also important ways of thinking about what are our next steps. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, so this is from the audience again, but climate change has begun to affect global food supplies and now we have the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with political entities beginning to limit the export of foodstuffs. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on this shifting scenario for already vulnerable populations? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is incredibly, this is an incredibly difficult time, right? Because uh, I think a lot of people are acknowledging that uh, an acute crisis like the coronavirus is, um, is happening. Uh, and it doesn't mean that everything, that, that the changes to climate aren't happening. Uh, and we are seeing in this moment why it's so critically important that our systems are in line. We talk about sort of inoculation of the physical body, but inoculating the systems, the, the, the political and economic systems, and certainly food systems is are criti critically important. And what's, again, the good news is that a number of people have been thinking about, good, smart people thinking about how we can allow for there to be uh, and a better approach to our food system, regenerative agriculture, uh, opportunities to have a multiple co-benefits in the way that we feed, and also making sure that, that uh, what are crises, oftentimes with food, famine, it's not about the absence of food, it's about the absence of coordinated structures to allow for that food to get to where it needs to go. And so this is, a, I think, a, a real primer for understanding why it's important to be pre prepared um, at the outset and what we need to double down on once we're sort of emerging from this this period of, uh, uh, of really unique um, and unprecedented uh, um, crisis. Thank you, that's great. So I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm sure there would be many more questions if we had more time. Um, so thank you very much again for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and we are gonna take a quick coffee break now.